So our, our next speaker is the official rabbi of the pre-trib study group, Arnold Fuchtenbaum. And uh, he has an amazing testimony and came to Christ when he was 12 years old in, in New York City area. Brook, was it Brooklyn? Oh, I was saved in Brooklyn. Yeah, he was saved in Brooklyn. <laughs> I was saved afterwards, saved out of Brooklyn. So then he was saved out of Brooklyn, went to, went to Cal- California. Uh, and he has started a ministry called Ariel and has a outreach to evangelize Jewish people and a few Gentiles thrown in here or there. I'll never forget he gave a talk once at one of the churches I was pastor of of is God still is God saving Gentiles? You know, because everybody always wants to know is God saving Jews. So he turned it around. Is God saving Gentiles today? And uh, <laughs> he is back in San Antonio, where he kind of began his ministry after being out on the left coast, out in California for a number of years. And uh, he, he says he has four pair of cowboy boots. And I think Lubbock Bible Church gave him his first pair, didn't they? My first cowboy boots were in Lubbock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so if any of you are coming in late, we have uh, some seats up here at the front. Yep. On the t- table. There's some here in the middle as well. Sorry to interrupt, Arnold. So uh, Arnold's going to be giving a talk about... Uh, what the Abrahamic covenant says and about the land of Israel and whether or not that was a temporary thing, you know, that's been done away with and things. So, uh, go ahead, Arnold. Mention of the cowboy boots, people think it's strange to have a Jewish cowboy. But remember, the most, the most famous name in cowboy western wear is Levi's. That's one of our names. <laughs> now, the, uh, the study I'll be doing is on the land promise in the Abrahamic Covenant. I'll begin with some views of different forms of replacement theology, and then we'll move into uh, the answer from a dispensational perspective. When dealing with the uh, views of replacement theology, let me say a few things about postmillennialism. Now, the postmillennialist post-millennialist equates the church with Israel, and that is the basic presupposition in how they interpret many of these prophetic passages. And often they do insist that the church is Israel, but they tend to be selective at what point the church is Israel. Whenever God says good things about Israel, that's the church. When God says bad about things about Israel, that's them Jews again. So they're not consistent how they applied the term Israel to uh, the issue of the church. Now Hodges, who um, has a post-millennial uh, systematic theology, presents six basic arguments against the concept of a final restoration of Israel to the land. His first argument is that the literal interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies relating to the restoration of Israel and the future kingdom of Christ cannot by possibility be carried out. Now, when he talks about God and talks about God's uh, um, omnipotence, he does a very good job on it. But somehow God does not, cannot make possible fulfilling the prophecies he made about his world's restoration. That's what he says, he wrote in the 1800s. It cannot uh, possibly be carried out. Uh, his second argument is based on the assumption the Bible frequently uses allegories, and all of these prophecies about Israel's uh, restoration are allegorical or symbolic. <laughs> and um, the restoration to land is simply meant to be taken symbolic, not of the Jews coming back to the land, but God gathering his elect into the church. The third argument is what he perceives as being the true Israel, which is the church. The fourth argument is based upon a denial of a consistent distinction between Israel and the church. His fifth argument goes like this. The apostles uniformly acted on this principle, 
They recognize no future for the Jews in which the Gentile Christians are not to participate. As under the old dispensation, proselytes from heathen were incorporated with the Jewish people, and all distinction between them and those uh, who are Jews by birth was lost, so it was under the gospel. Gentiles and Jews were united in undistinguished and undistinguishable membership in the same church, and so it has continued their present day. The two streams, Jews and Gentiles, unite in the apostolic church, having flowed one uh, on as one great river through all ages. As this was by divine ordinance, it is not to be believed that it to be separated in the future. And the Hodges' sixth argument is based upon a misunderstanding as to what those who believe in a literal in restoration actually teach. And perhaps there was some in Hodges' day that taught that the restoration of Israel meant a position of preeminence over the church of the future, but that is not the position of mainline premillennialism, either in community theology or dispensationalism. True Israel will be the head and not the tail over the Gentile nations. But this is now saying the same thing as being head over the church. Hodge recognizes that the belief in a final restoration of Israel is very much a part of premillennialism, but he objects to this on the grounds that there is no authority for this belief in the didactic portions of the New Testament. Another uh, post mill Barton also interprets prophecy on the basis that the church is Israel. Also like Judd, uh, like Hodge, um, Barton denies that there it will ever be a literal restoration of the Jews to the land. And here's a quote. When Ezekiel says uh, that Israel is to be restored to a land forever, he indicates clearly that those words are not to be taken literally. He says that my servant David shall be king over them, and David my servant shall be their prince forever. Jeremiah likewise says that David is to be their king. If we take that literally, then David must be raised from the dead to be the millennial king in Palestine, David and not Christ. The literal literal says that David here is used as a symbol for Christ. But that is not what the Bible says. To take David as a symbol for Christ would be to spiritualize the prophecy away. If the other parts of the prophecy are literal, this must be as uh, too. Uh, too. Now, what he says is basically true that many, even many dispensationalists take those Davidic passages to be symbolic of the Messiah, but also many of us, like myself, that take the passage literally. It talks about the real David to be resurrected from the dead and to rule with Jesus over Israel in the same way that the church saints will rule with Jesus over the Gentile nations. And so there'll be two branches of government in the kingdom, a Gentile branch where the church co-rules with the Messiah, and the Jewish branch where, the, where David will co with the Messiah. So not all of us take the term David to be symbolic of the Messiah. In other words, Batna makes a confession. This disagreement arises primarily because of the different methods of interpretation. It is generally agreed that if the prophecies are taken literally, they do foretell a restoration of the nation of Israel to the land of Palestine, and with the Jews having a prominent place in that kingdom, a ruling over other nations, end of quote. Notice he admits that if you take the prophecies literally, then dispensationalists are correct. But he insists you cannot um, take the Bible that way. And to prove it, he claims that the Old Covenant, which says the Old Testament, has no bearing on the church. The church can only teach what is taught in the New Testament. And again, a quote, The old order died when Christ died. No requirements from the old covenant are binding on the Christian except the moral principles that are repeated in the New Testament. The Old Testament is our history book, not our law book. Now, after dealing with uh, a scattered way with this theology in the first 300 pages of his book, He goes on to devote the whole chapter on the subject called the Jews and Palestine. In his opening paragraph, he denounces the belief the restoration of the Jews to land is part of God's divine program. Now, Barton is simply not happy with the reestablishment of the Jewish state. And Barton not only blames the Jews for their own problems in the diaspora, he also (coughs) also blames them for all the problems of the Middle East. (laughs) 
While admitting that the Arabs are not perfect, he still puts the majority of the blame on the Jews. In harsh terminology, Bach denies that, uh, that the Jews have any right whatsoever to their own land. In fact, he claims the Jews do not belong anywhere. Here's a quote, The mere fact that these people are Jews does not in itself give them any more moral or legal right to Palestine than to the United States or to any other part of the world. End of the quote. So Jews don't belong anywhere. The Jews do have existed this day, and this fact seems to be an embarrassment to Bautner. The continued existence of the Jews does not sit well with his form of post militism And what would Bautner do with the Jews? He wants them to disappear, but fortunately he does not resort to Hitler's approach. Rather, he wished the Jews would simply choose to assimilate and disappear. But to Bautner's dismay, the Jews have have reestablished their own country. He must therefore deny that this is in any way related to Bible prophecy, or the Jews are still a covenanted people of God. He wrote his book back in 1957. Israel then was quite small. This was before the Six-Day War. And um, he figured that just maybe Jews get more land. So he, he writes like this. It may be in the years to come that Jews will possess a large part or even all of Palestine. We do not know. But if they do, they will secure it as other nations secure property through negotiation or purchase or conquest not by virtue of any as yet unfulfilled prophecies or promises. There are no such prophecies or promises. Obviously, there are, but he allegorizes them away to refer to the church. And therefore, he concludes that the state of Israel is the work of man, not of God. Here again is a quote. As these things bear upon the reestablishment of the state of Israel, we must say that this project carried out among uh, are carried out almost exclusively by unbelieving Jews, is not of God in the sense that was foretold by his prophets or those blessings upon it. Rather, it is a humanistic project, which in all probability is headed for increasing serious trouble. Although the Jewish people have a consuming zeal for the land of Palestine, their real need is not Palestine but Christ. And never will they find real peace, individual or as a nation, until they turn to faith in him. Now turning to the Amil view, because they only recognize one covenant, the covenant of grace, covenant Amilinarians not only refuse to recognize the the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants to be distinct, they also fail to recognize the new covenant as being distinct. Burkhoff refuses to see any major difference of the various administrations of the covenant of grace in the Old Testament dispensation. He also fails to see any real difference between the Old Testament dispensation and the New Testament dispensation. Because he insists on only one covenant of grace, Burkhoff cannot admit any essential difference between the Old Testament dispensation and the New Testament dispensation. The fact that the New Testament speaks of a new covenant is dismissed as meaning that its administration differs in several particulars from that of the Old Testament. That is also true between the administrations of the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Sinai. For Burkhoff, the new covenant is a new, is new not because it is another covenant, because its administration differs in several particulars. And Cox follows the same logic. As a covenant theologian, he holds that there is only one covenant operating operative today, and that is the covenant of grace. It's obvious, however, that the scriptures speak of a number of covenants which are separate and distinct uh, from one another. It even distinguishes the old covenant from the new one, and Cox will explain it this way. Here's a quote. It would seem that when the Bible speaks of old covenant and new covenant, it's a matter of accommodation. This to say that God is accommodating his language to the understanding of finite man. For to be sure, God is all-knowing, and in his mind there is, there has always been only one plan of salvation for man. Every inspired writer who spoke in the scriptures of old and new covenants could have well added the words of Paul, I speak after the manner of men. For in God's sight there is, there has always been but one eternal plan which he has unfolded through a progressive revelation to man. 
However, from man's perspective, that plan has been unfolded in sections as he was able to grasp it. And these integral parts of God's eternal whole has been referred to by accommodation as the covenant of Abraham, Mosaic covenant, new covenant, and so forth. End of quote. In other words, when the Bible speaks of different covenants, it does not really mean different covenants. Such language was necessary for the purpose of accommodation so that man could understand what was happening. The separate covenants like the Abrahamic Mosaic New are all merely facets of the same covenant, the one covenant of grace. Otherwise, man would not have been able to understand God's revelation. Was the ancient man really that ignorant? Certainly, if a biblical writer said there was only one covenant to be revealed in stages, it would have been easily understood. Cox is trying to fit that which the Bible reveals into this theology and has to explain the way the plurality of the covenants by saying it was merely an accommodation. Now, let's see how they treat the Abrahamic covenant. If there is only one covenant, the covenant of grace, then obviously there cannot be distinct, there could be no distinctively Jewish covenants. In the Abrahamic covenant, Cox states, and I quote, First of all, the covenant with Abraham was not given to a Jew, nor was it given to exclusively to Jews. This may come as a shock to many who have been reared on glitches of Jewish theology. For Abraham has been called out of Ur of the Chaldees and had received the covenant long before Israel as a nation came into existence. Thus bear in mind that Israel as we know it today originated with Jacob, who lived two generations after Abraham. What the spirit of the Old Testament teaches is that the Old Covenant people was made up primarily, but not entirely, of Israelites. God arbitrarily chose that nation to be an example to the world. He gave them special training and insight in order that they might be a peculiar people and evangelize the entire world. But this we need to learn. The futurists ignore it. Israel failed God. Since the covenant was conditional, the contract was broken. Since the covenant was conditional, uh, and God is now not bound to Israel as a nation, his covenant is now with um, the faithful remnant, and with the Gentile believers, and these two groups constitute the Christian church, which today is the Israel of God. Now, these statements are made in opposition to the obvious emphasis in the Abrahamic covenant that on a singular nation, they will physically descend from Abraham and emphasize that both Abraham and his descendants will inherit the land of Canaan. Cox makes a strong effort to deny the Jewish nature of the covenant so that he can reach his conclusion. Number one, God is now bound to Israel as a nation. Number two, his covenant is with the church. And number three, this church is the Israel of God. When he turns to the New Testament, he will continue the same kind of thinking. Here's again a quote. A whole host of New Testament scriptures show conclusively the new covenant prophesied by Jeremiah was established with the church made up of both Jews and Gentiles without distinction. Although the covenant was made with Judah and Israel of the Old Testament, it was fulfilled in the spiritual Israel of the New Testament as the church. Now, Jeremiah 31, 31 clearly predicts the new covenant made with both houses of Israel, which is as clear as the Bible can say, is made with the national Israel. This Cox admits, he then insists that in actuality, the covenant was not made with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel, but with the church, which Cox claims is the spiritual Israel of the New Testament. He repeats later, Although the covenant was made with Judah and Israel of the Old Testament, it was fulfilled in the spiritual Israel of the New Testament. That was the church. Even this, however, was proposed in scriptures such as Zechariah 2.11. If you read Zechariah 2.11, it says no such thing, by the way. Now, what he does, what he says, at least he admits that initially it looks like the covenant was made with the Jewish people. And perhaps it was, he's willing to admit, but he goes on to say, however... God did not fulfill it with little Israel, but with the church. Now, if uh, you have two children, for example, and you promise your first child a bicycle, and you promise that you'll give him a bicycle at a certain point of time, but then the child does something to offend you, you go ahead and buy the bicycle, but you give it to a second child. Have you fulfilled your promise? No. No. 
No matter what you may want to do for the second child, until you also give a bicycle to the first child, the promise remains unfulfilled. And that is something that these people don't seem to understand. If God makes a promise to a person or people, it must be fulfilled to that person or to that people. It, no matter what else may God, whatever else God may do for not the group like the church, like the body, the Messiah, whatever God may do for that, it cannot do, if, if replace the promises he made to Israel. Whatever else he may do for the church until he fulfills every promise he made to Israel, then the promise remains unfulfilled. And so I keep in mind there's a principle in Scripture. Every promise of God must be fulfilled and must be fulfilled to whom the promise is made. Now, in dealing with Israel today in their system, covenant and millennialists deny that Israel today has any biblical right to, to the land. Alice raises the issue in his preface. It's important to note that he wrote that his first work was published in 1945, soon after Nazi Holocaust, before Israel became a state in 1948. Alice allows his covenant a millennial theology to determine his view of national home for the Jews. Because the idea of a national restoration of Israel is foreign to this theology, Alice is opposed to this on any grounds, which is political or social. Branding the Jews as a world problem, Alice denies that the solution to the problem is a national home for the Jews. As sometimes I call this book Alice in Blunderland. <laughs> now, because of its aim and approach, Alice sets up an either or proposition that need not be so. The option is that the Christian statesmen and the Christian churchmen must either support Zionism or offer the Jews salvation within her fold. This either or proposition is a result of amenism, for dispensationalism can allow both options at the same time. That would give the Jewish people the gospel, also support Israel's right to land. Alice is a good example of Psalmist ideology definitely colors his thinking about the Jewish question. Alice is correct when he states, that the answer given to by the churchmen will determine his conception of the duty of the church towards the Jews, and that the answer given by Christian statements will determine their attitude towards Zionism and their political and national aspirations, what it fosters and hopes to realize. How one responds to these issues will differ if he is a millennial or if he is dispensational. The preface states that sets the tone for the way Alice treats Israelology throughout his work, especially rejecting the dispensational approach in this, at the same topic. His Israelology is sometimes tinged with anti-Semitism. In a chapter entitled The Jewish Remnant, Alice reveals clearly what he dislikes about dispensationalism, his the quote. For saying this, he has placed his finger on the sore point in dispensational teaching. The exaltation of the Jew per se, in the glorification of the Jew and the rose the future assigned to him, dispensationalist v. with Zionists, the future belongs to the Jew. So for Alice, the dispensational position on the future of Israel the Jewish people is the sore point. This is not the first time that Alice has linked dispensationalism with Zionism in a negative way. Again, it is hard to escape the feeling that Alice is anti-Semitic, which is to a large extent helped determine his theology. Now, the Emmanuel view concerning prophecy states that whatever has been promised to national Israel has already been fulfilled. Concerning the Abrahamic covenant, Alice points out that this covenant contains three main features, the seed, the land, and the nations. Alice sees the first two facets as having already been fulfilled even before the first coming, while the third facet is in progress. As to the seed aspect, Alice claims that this has already been fulfilled based upon the language of these passages. However, the original promise was never limited to a short period of time, such as the golden age of the monarchy, but was viewed as something that would be continual, continually true. As for land aspect, Alice also claims that this has already been fulfilled in the, land, uh, in the days of the monarchy, because the dominion of David and Solomon extended from the Euphrates to the river of Egypt. And Alice writes, quote, Consequently, we may say that in respect in which the Abrahamic covenant particularly concerned Israel, 
It can be regarded as having been fulfilled centuries before the first advent. While in its universal aspect in which it concerned all nations of the earth, it was scarcely fulfilled at all during the Old Testament period. And others object to dispensational view of the kingdom precisely because of its Jewish nature. And he writes as follows, Dispensationalists V with those of the circumcision in proclaiming the greatness and glory that is in store for the Jews as an earthly people on this earth. And salvation for all of the inhabitants of the earth for all ages is to come with literally of the Jews. This Judaizes human history to an appalling degree, and in doing so, sadly disparages the Christian church. And concerning the prophecies about Israel's restoration, Another, Amil Horkema, writes, Prophecies of this sort may be fulfilled early. As we have just seen, all the prophecies quoted about the restoration of Israel to its land have been literally fulfilled, either return from Babylonian captivity under Zerubbabel and Joshua, or in a later return under Ezra. So the restoration prophecies there are to have been fulfilled after they came back from Babylon. So to summarize the views of replacement theology. Basically, there's three different views about these prophecies about Israel's restoration. The first view is that the land promises were fulfilled under Joshua, and that's based upon a key passage, Joshua 11 and verse 23. Also, using the Joshua 21 passage that was mentioned in the Q&A. I'll come back to this a bit later in our study in this paper. The second view, the land promises were fulfilled under David and Solomon because they ruled all this territory. But what is missed is that the prophecies do not talk about military control or military occupation. It talks about Jewish settlement in all of the promised land. And under David and Solomon, even then, didn't have all of the promised land, but they had most of it. It was mostly under military occupation. And um, the prophecies required is Jewish settlement not merely military occupation. And furthermore, Lebanon, ancient Phoenicia, was never part of that kingdom. Always remained independent from David and Solomon. And so, um, uh, even under the monarchy, you cannot say these prophecies have truly been fulfilled. And the third view is that the return from Babylon fulfilled all restoration prophecies. The problem is that the last two passages in this paragraph, notice Jeremiah 24, verse 24, and Amos chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, clearly prophesy a restoration for which they can never be exiled again. A restoration, a return to land they can never be forced out of again. And, and in 70 AD, there was another worldwide dispersion. And therefore, return from Babylon could not possibly fulfill the prophecies like those of Jeremiah and Amos. And these are basic views of uh, replacement theology. Let's move on now to the review of dispensationalism. The four primary facets of Israel's final restoration, you have the regeneration of Israel, the regathering of Israel, the possession of the land, and the reestablishment of the Davidic throne. Now we're going to focus specifically on the topic of the land promise of the Abrahamic covenant and how it has been dealt with subsequent to the accounts within Genesis and outside of Genesis. So calculate the Abrahamic covenant in the book of Genesis. Now, the Genesis, uh, the Abrahamic covenant begins in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, where God promises to show Abraham a land, but nothing more than that is promised for now. He's merely promised to be shown a land and nothing more. When he arrives into land in chapter 12, verse 7, then God says that God will give the land to his descendants, to his seed. Nothing is promised to Abraham himself just yet but his descendants will someday have ownership of the land. We get to Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 to 17. I won't be reading the quotes. In that passage, after Slot and uh, Abraham separate, well, God, um, then God says to Abraham, look uh, in all directions, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see, to you will I give it and to your seed. And then in verse 17, Arise, walk through the land, the length of it, and the breadth of it, for unto you will I give it. 
And notice here the land is promised specifically to the to Abraham himself. Abraham and his seed are to possess the land. And when you allegorize these things away, then um, verses like verse 17 become meaningless. Because in uh, replacement theology, they ultimately identified the land not to be the true real estate of the land of Canaan. Rather, they simply claim that this uh, symbolizes that someday he'll come to heaven. That renders verse 17 meaningless. What is God asking Abraham to do in verse 17? Is he saying to Abraham, come up to heaven, spend a few days with me up here and see if you like the place? <laughs> verse 17 makes sense only if it's talking about a real piece of real estate. He talks, walk the land, the length of it, and the breadth of it. Front to you will I give it. What you have in verse 17, by the way, is the first ever holy land tour. First one. <laughs> To walk the length of it, to walk the breadth of it, because he will someday ownership of it. But by the time Abraham died, what did he own? He owned one burial cave that he paid good money for, and also when he, um, uh, when he owned some wells. That was the extent of his real estate holdings. So how is God ever going to keep his promise to Abraham? He must raise him from the dead and bring him to land. And we'll come back to that a bit later. Now, in Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 to 21, he, he, this passage is where God signs and seals the Abrahamic covenant by means of the Shekhinah, by means of the Shekinah glory. And he, and he spells out the borders, the southern and northern borders of the land. And he points out that the northern border is, is the Euphrates, the southern border is the river of Egypt. And that uh, confuses people because sometimes it says the brook of Egypt and the river of Egypt, and these are not the same two things. The Hebrew word for river is where the water continually, continually flows, and the Hebrew word for brook is what we now call awadi, using the Arabic word, awadi, where water flows only during the rain season, uh, even then, not throughout the rain season. And so the brook of Egypt refers to what is now called the wadi el arish which points out that will be the southern settlement of the Promised Land, as Ezekiel chapters 47 and 48 point out. But River Egypt it cannot be the Nile, because if that was the Nile, the Jews already in the Promised Land before they left Egypt. If the Nile is the southern border of the Promised Land, the Jews already in the Promised Land before they left the Egypt. But the river of Egypt refers to something else as the, you know, the Nile flows from south to north into the Nile Delta, splits into various uh, tributaries. And the most eastern branch of, of um, the Nile uh, tributary it was, was referred to as the river of Egypt. And that's about the same place where the Suez Canal was dug later on. So while Jewish settlement will go as far south as the Wadi El Arish, Jewish control will call sovereignty all the way towards now the Suez Canal, ancient river of Egypt. But now itself could not be the southern border because that's way beyond the borders of the promised land. Now Genesis chapter 17, as God also now in, uh, uh, incorporates circumcision to be the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, also makes a promise in um, verses 19 to 21 that he'll give them the land of Israel. And so God promised the land not only to uh, the descendants of Abraham, but to Abraham himself. Altogether, Abraham had eight sons. God did not choose to confirm the covenant through all eight sons, only one, that is Isaac. In Genesis chapter 26, verses 2 through 5, he reconfirms the covenant through Isaac and tells Isaac, we told Abraham, to you and to your seed, I will give this land. And therefore, Ishmael is removed, the other six sons of Abraham are removed, and only through Isaac is the covenant sustained. Isaac had two sons, and God did not choose to confirm the covenant with both sons, only one. In Genesis chapter 28, verses 13 to 15, he focuses on Jacob and reconfirms the covenant through Jacob. And therefore, Esau is not part of the covenantal relationship. And then in Genesis chapter 49, he confirms the covenant through all 12 sons of Jacob, and therefore they fall under the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Jewishness is determined not by Abraham alone, nor by Abraham and Isaac alone, but only Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
that line is what constitutes the Jewish people and the people of Israel. But, um, and uh, by the time you come to the end of Genesis, the covenant has been sustained, confirmed through all 12 sons. Now, the capital B, the continuity of the covenant. Because the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional, it is still very much in effect, though it has remained largely unfulfilled. The ultimate fulfillment will come during the kingdom age. The unconditional nature of the covenant is affirmed and reaffirmed a number of times. For example, although it is clear that Israel and Egypt, Israel and the wilderness was not a righteous nation, since, many, since the majority constantly had a tendency to rebel and to murmur, yet God rescued them and brought them into land on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. And in chapter 2 of Exodus, he clearly states that the, um, he's bringing them out of Egypt on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant, the one he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he reaffirms this again in the book of Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 through 8. The rest of the, re- the removal from Egypt and be brought into the land of Canaan is based upon the Abrahamic covenant. And that is also behind what happened in, Genesis, in Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. Because in two chapters, in chapters um, uh, 3 and 4, God talks to Moses, trying to convince Moses to be the one to bring Israel out of Egypt. There's a key, there's a key word that, that is used when people respond to God, is the word hineni, here am I, followed by send me. So when God called, uh, for example, he called Isaiah, Isaiah said, Hineni, here am I, send me. When God called Abraham, he said, Hineni, here am I, send me. And when God even called Jacob, he said, Hineni, here am I, send me. When he calls Moses, Moses says, Hineni, here am I, send Aaron. <laughs> and it took us, God finally had to severely treat Moses uh, negatively, and he finally um, obeyed God to do it. But now in chapter 4, he's on his way to Egypt to fulfill what God had called him to do. And then strangely it says, Jehovah met him and sought to kill him in verse 24. And um, the problem was, as the context shows, is that he had failed to circumcise his second son. Because when the first son was born, uh, Moses had the first son circumcised. When the second son was born, um, because of his wife's objections, um, he failed to do so. Because he is married to a Midianite, all the Midianites were descendants of Abraham as well. They did not practice circumcision. So apparently over her objection, he failed to, rec- to circumcise his second son, and therefore is living in disobedience to the, to the Abrahamic covenant. And Genesis chapter 17 Genesis 17 specifies he does not circumcise, shall be cut off from among his people. So, the, so as we saw in chapter 2 of Exodus, God was not going to use Moses to rescue the people out of Egypt. But how could he use a man who was being disobedient to very Abrahamic covenant, the basis of the Exodus to begin with? So he must put Abraham to obedience, and he strikes him with some kind of a uh, disease by which uh, he's too weak to move. His wife, Zipporah, understands what the problem is, and she does not like what she has to do, but she proceeds to circumcise the second son. And then, because she calls her husband a bloody bridegroom, a bloody bridegroom. She was half uh, Midianite and half British. <laughs> Some of you are a bit slow on that one. <laughs> As a result, she was sent back uh, to Midian. She didn't get to see the miracles of the Exodus. And she was reunited with Moses only when they got to Mount Sinai. But the, but the events of, half, of he almost killed Moses have to do with the continuity of the Abrahamic covenant. And because God was going to rescue the people on the basis of the covenant, had to put Moses in obedience to that covenant. And in, and in, Deuteronomy, and, um, in the book of Deuteronomy, again, he reaffirms to Moses the promise of the land based upon the Abrahamic covenant. I will give you unto your seed... And uh, Moses won't get to go over, but the seed will. 
And although Israel has had a long history of, of disobedience and idolatry, and although God frequently disciplined the nation, yet he promised the nation would always survive on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. It was on that basis Moses pleaded God to spare Israel from the divine wrath. This is at the sin of the golden calf. He said he would now destroy the whole nation, make a new nation of Moses, and Moses pleads on behalf of Israel, and the basis of his plea is the Abrahamic covenant, that God promised to make a nation through the patriarchs, and not through Moses, and therefore it must be fulfilled. Another passage often overlooked in these discussions is Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 to 33. And this was uh, the discussion between the Messiah and the Sadducees. As you have already known, there was key differences between the Pharisees and Sadducees. One of these issues had to do with the issue of the resurrection. The Pharisees believed with the coming of the Messiah, there'd be a resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not believe there would ever be any future resurrection. And that's why they were sad, you see. And the Sadducees liked to ask the Pharisees trick questions to make them look stupid and often succeeded. Here they try those trick questions on Jesus and they come to him and say, we have a theological problem, maybe you can solve it for us. There was a couple that had seven sons and the oldest son married this one uh, woman, but he dies without children. So in keeping with the Mosaic law, the second son marries her. He also dies with no children. So again, in keeping with the Mosaic law, a third brother marries her. He also dies with no kids. In the course of time, all seven brothers were married as one woman. All seven died without children. After a while, she also passed away. Now in the resurrection, which they did not believe in anyway, but never mind, in the resurrection, whose wife is she going to be because all seven have been married to her? If the Sadducees had come to me with that question, my answer would have been a bit different than what Jesus chose to give. In my case, out of call for a grand jury investigation to find out, why are these guys dying off so soon after they married this one woman? <laughs> There's something very suspicious here. But he chose to ignore that fast of the problem. That's what he does not do. He does not quote the three classic passages in the Hebrew Bible that clearly teaches resurrection. He does not quote Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, Isaiah 26, verse 19, or Job 19, verse 25 and 26. These are three passages that clearly teach for resurrection. He does not quote them, and why not? Because another difference between Pharisaic Judaism and Sadducean Judaism was this. In Sadducean Judaism, every doctrine had to originate with the five books of Moses. And then you can use the prophets or the writings uh, to, to uh, illustrate that doctrine, but the origin has to be from the five books of Moses. And um, they could not find any evidence of the five books of Moses, and therefore chose not to believe in it. So quoting Daniel, Isaiah, or Job would have been authoritative for the Pharisees, but not authoritative for the Sadducees. So what he does is quote Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, God says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And this was the biblical formula for what we now simply call the Abrahamic covenant. We've simplified our terminology today. We say Abrahamic covenant, but in Scripture it's a sentence. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But where in the Abrahamic covenant is there a teaching of a resurrection? It's contained in a very simple principle that we indicated earlier. If God makes a promise to an individual, and that individual dies before the promise is fulfilled, God is then obligated to raise the person back to life. And why? Because every promise of God must be fulfilled, and must be fulfilled to whom the promise was made. And that was the principle in the mind of Abraham when he was asked to sacrifice Isaac. Why was Abraham ready to plunge the, the knife into Isaac's throat? Because by then Abraham knew that God is a promise-keeping God. If you have to kill Isaac, Abraham knew God raised him back to life. But how did God, Abraham know that? God did not say he would do that. But by then Abraham knew if God made a promise to Isaac... Isaac dies before the promise is fulfilled, and God has to raise Isaac back to life. 
because every promise of God must be fulfilled to whom the promise is made. And so that's why Abraham was willing to, uh, to, to plunge the knife into Isaac's throat. He believed in the resurrection based upon the promises of God made to Isaac already. And um, right contained, therefore, within the unfulfilled promises made to the patriarchs and made to Israel, that contains already the promise of the resurrection. And so Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 says that in the kingdom, people will come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And the patriarchs will be in the messianic kingdom, and they will uh, sit down with the uh, people who come to visit with them, to sup with them, to fellowship with them, because they'll be resurrected from the dead and enjoying the promised land. And um, Leviticus 26, verses 40 to 42, in the future restoration of Israel, he clearly states that when Israel comes to confess their sin, God says to remember his covenant with Jacob and with Isaac and with Abraham, he says, I will remember the land. <coughs> and when Israel undergoes the national restoration and salvation restoration, then they'll finally possess all the promised land and settle in all the promised land. Now, as far as the land covenant, some, uh, Charlie Clark will be dealing with this more thoroughly in, in uh, the afternoon. Let me just point out that in the land covenant, what God uh, promises is that there will be an ultimate final restoration following Israel's national salvation. And the uh, point of the, the, of the land covenant is simply that the, that the promises of the Abrahamic covenant concerning the land is ongoing. Because between the Abrahamic covenant, the land covenant came the Mosaic covenant where God says, if they're disobedient, God will disperse the Jews around the world. And therefore the question could be raised, will Israel's disobedience to the Mosaic covenant render Israel's ownership of the land null and void? And the land covenant says, no, it will not render it null and void. And you have to keep two principles in balance. First of all, ownership of the land is unconditional, based upon the Abrahamic covenant. Ownership of the land is unconditional, but enjoyment of the land is conditional obedience. That's the land covenant. Ownership is unconditional, and um, enjoyment is conditional obedience. And that's why through all the biblical history, uh, they never had all the promised land. You had a principle of more or less, more or less. Under Joshua, more, judges less, David and Solomon more, and then after Solomon's death, less again until they went into Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. The same thing we see with the modern Jewish state. In 1948, there was less. In 1967, there was more. And now since then, there's been less again. But the principle of more or less, more or less will continue until they become a believing people. And then they will finally settle in all of the promised land and finally live in peace within the promised land. But until then, the principle of more or less, more or less will continue. But ownership of the land is unconditional. Enjoyment of it is conditional obedience. And that is the point that should not be ignored. Now, as far as Kabbalah see the present now working the Abrahamic covenant, now again, the, prom- the Abrahamic covenant promised a seed, a land, and spiritual blessings. Now, focus for us is the land itself. I might point out that since the year A.D. 70, there's, not, there's never been an a independent government over the land of Israel. The land has been overrun many times, always ruled by different groups such as Romans and uh, Byzantines, by Arabs and by Turks and by the British and others. But um, it, was always, um, it was always ruled from somewhere else. It did not, didn't have its own autonomous separate government. And even Jerusalem was um, controlled by different um, Arab populations, but it was ruled from either Baghdad or from Amman or from uh, Damascus or from Baghdad. But even under Arab rule, it was never set up to be an independent Arab country, an independent Arab state. And so there's never been a Palestinian state, a Palestinian government, a Palestinian flag. Only as of 1948 that she once again had an autonomous government, and that's the government of the state of Israel today. 
Let's talk about the issue that, that uh, was raised in the Q&A, but it's also at the bottom of this paper here. Uh, that's based upon Joshua 11, verse 23, because it clearly states that God gave to Israel all the land that he promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. If you stop there, then you can go ahead and teach, as some replacement theologians teach, the land promise has already been fulfilled. If that's where you stop. But keep in mind, there were no chapter divisions. When the book was written, those come, come much later. Look at the structure of the book of Joshua. At the end of chapter 11, you have the seven-year national war ending, and the land has been divided among the, uh, will be divided among the tribes, and now each tribe will be responsible to, re- to continue the conquest of their own tribal territories. So the end of Gen- Joshua 11, verse 23, it says God gave them all the land he promised the patriarchs. In chapter 12, he goes on to say, that um, he lists all the kings that Joshua killed on both sides of the Jordan. But look at chapter 13, verses 1 through 6 of Joshua. He says to Joshua, there is still much land yet to be taken. In other words, he took all the land, he killed all these kings, and I heard the exceptions to chapter 11, verse 23. If you look at the territory mentions in verses 1 through 6 and put them in a, in a mild, in modern in Middle East map, Israel captured only about a third of the promised land under Joshua. Two-thirds remained as enemy territory. Further, within the book of Joshua, it even tells you what they did not take. For example, in chapter 15, verse 63, Jerusalem was still Jebusite at the time the book of Joshua was written. It remained Jebusite until David takes it. Furthermore, in chapter 16, verse 10, 1610, the city of Gezer remained uh, Canaanite all the way through uh, Solomon's reign. Only under Solomon, they finally become a Jewish city. So even within the book of Joshua, you have specific statements of territories that was not taken. You had individual cities within the territories they did take, and also great uh, bodies of territory they did not take. So you've taken everything Joshua teaches, he very clearly states, not all the land have been taken. And now look at, Josh, at the book of Judges, chapter 1. I listed the verses in, in your own paper here. That when you move into from a national war to the tribal wars, it lists tribe after tribe after tribe that failed to take their own territory. It took some of it, but not all of it. Tribe after tribe failed to take their territory. But more important, look at Judges, chapter 2, which is on your notes here in the verses quote. Joshua, Judges chapter 2, verses 20 and 23. And let's read this. And the anger of Jehovah was killed against Israel, and he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them the nations that Joshua left when he died, that by them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of Jehovah to walk therein, as the fathers did not keep it, uh, did keep it or not. And look at verse 23. So Jehovah left those nations without driving them out hastily. And note the last phrase, neither delivered he them in the hand of Joshua. Neither he delivered them in the hand of Joshua. So either Judges chapter 2 verse 23 contradicts Joshua 11 verse 23, or Judges chapter 2 verse 23 simply continues the explanation we all learned from Joshua. In Joshua, we had all these exceptions, and more than two-thirds of the promised land had not yet been taken. And now chapter Judges 2.23 specifies, he did not deliver them into the hand of Joshua. So clearly, this explains uh, that, that God did not uh, fulfill the land promise in the days of Joshua. And uh, if you pull 11.23 of Joshua out of context, you can teach that. If you keep in the context of Joshua alone, then they're judges to it. They didn't get all the land. So to summarize, the promised land is, remains only a land of promise, never yet fulfilled. Mere military occupation does not fulfill the promise. Only a Jewish settlement in all of the promised land can fulfill the covenantal promise. Furthermore, they must live in all of the promised land in peace, peace, 
to fulfill the promises of God, there must be a restoration from which they can never again be forcefully exiled again. This awaits the messianic kingdom. It does not, has not been fulfilled with return from Babylonian captivity. As far as the um, future of the Abraham recovering the land, there's a lot of prophecies here. Let me just summarize uh, the remaining prophecies, and then we'll have our questions. But the Isaiah 11, verse 11, pastor, chapter 12, verse 6, chapter 11, verse 11 and 12, points out there can only be two worldwide regatherings, not three, four, or five, only two. And he points out the final worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for the blessings of the kingdom is the second one. If the last one is the second one, how many more can you have before that one? If with new math, only one. The Bible is only for two worldwide regatherings. The first one is what we see right now, a worldwide regard and belief in preparation for judgment, the judgment of the tribulation. But this is not yet the final restoration. The final restoration comes only when we become a believing people. And there'll be a second worldwide regard in faith in preparation for blessing, the blessings of the Messianic kingdom. Now the passage in Isaiah chapter 27, verses 12 and 13, he points out in verse 12 that he will gather them one by one until every Jew is back in the land of Israel. And furthermore, he mentions both the north and southern borders of the promised land because only the messianic kingdom will be finally settled in all of the promised land. And uh, Isaiah 35 talks about Israel's deserts to blossom. Most of Israel is still desert but the, the last, all the desert will disappear. But look at Isaiah chapter 43. I've quoted the verse here in the notes, verses 5 to 7. He talks about Israel's final restoration to land. He uses three key words, created, formed, and made. Created, formed, and made. And where else do you have those three words used together? In the creation account of Genesis chapters 1 and 2, certain things God created, certain things he made, certain things he formed. And by using these same three words in connection with this was final restoration to land, he points out from the divine perspective they'll be viewed on the magnitude of the original creation. And again, only something that God could do. In Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, Jeremiah makes a different connection with the Exodus. He points out that the common saying is, God has brought us out of Egypt. Even many rabbis today talk about God as the one who brought us out of the land of Egypt. The Exodus is still the high point of Jewish history, but that will change with the final restoration. In the kingdom, they will say, Thus the Lord lives who brought us out of all the nations, which has driven us. And therefore, Israel's high point is yet to be reached. Um, I'll give you some other passages to watch in those. We don't need to cover every one of those. But let's look at the passage in, um, in the book of the, close the end of the paper, Ezekiel chapters um, 47 and 48. It is in that passage that he spells out the borders of the promised land. He spells out how the Jewish people will settle once again, there'll be tribal divisions, though the divisions will not be the same as those in the book of Joshua. And he points out that they'll go equally north to south. There'll be seven tribes in sequence, then especially New High Mountain, which will have the new millennial Jerusalem and the millennial temple, and then five more tribes below the mount. And it, it, it was Ezekiel described in the last two chapters of his book as the actual fulfillment of all those covenantal promises. They'll finally live in all of the borders of the promised land, not just occupy it, but live in it, sell in it, and finally live in peace. So Israel's high point is yet to be reached. So to summarize the last paragraph, to summarize this section, for the first time in Israel's history, she will possess all the promised land, while the land itself would greatly increase its productivity and be well watered, all on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant can only be fulfilled, finally, only when they finally do settle all the promised land and live on it, and live on it in peace and security. Sila. Go ahead. Sure. I have about uh, a thousand questions for you, but I've narrowed it down to 999. Ask them one, ask them one by one, please. Okay. 
Um, I'm taking a lot of classes through IJS, which I highly recommend. I have a lot of your material. Uh, but how much exposure do you recommend that a Gentile have to rabbinic tradition and, and the Talmud when witnessing to a Jewish person? Uh, I would say with, uh, it's helpful with the orthodoxy who still take a lot of time in studying the Talmud. Mm. But most Jewish people today are quite secular. Yes. And most Jewish people do not spend much time in Talmudic studies, even less so on scripture. So the average Jewish person you meet knows nothing about this material. So I don't think it will be that much that beneficial. What you should be able to do is, is deal, deal with the, um, the prophecies of the Old Testament, even with the most secular Jews, this could be very effective. Mm-hmm. You should be able to present the gospel starting with the Old Testament, what kind of Messiah did the Old Testament say Messiah would be. Once you establish that, move into New Testament. But the nature of the community. I can tell you a story that illustrates how secular the Jewish community has become. The story of a Jewish family that had a son that moved into a neighborhood the next door. Men, neighbors happened to be Baptist. They both had sons the same age. The two sons became uh, friends. And one day the Baptist son asked the Jewish son to go with him to Sunday school class. The Jewish son asked his parents. They were a bit nervous about this, but they were very secular. Didn't do any practicing of rituals or anything. So, they t- t- so to avoid making an issue, he told that they told the son, you can go this one time, but when you come back, they'll tell us what they taught you at the Baptist schools in case we have to give you a different perspective. The two boys went to Sunday school class. When they came back, um, the Jewish parents asked their son, what did they teach you at that Baptist school? He said, well, they taught us about Moses. The Jewish parents were a bit surprised. They taught you about Moses. What did they say about Moses? But well, what they said was that most of the children of Israel out of Egypt, the Egyptian army began to chase them. So Moses built a pontoon bridge across the Red Sea. The Jews went across the pontoon bridge. When the Egyptian army tried to follow them, Moses called an airstrike, destroying the bridge, and the Jews were saved. The Jewish parents asked the Jew, asked their son, is that what they taught you at the Baptist school? He said, it's not the way they put it. If I told you what they really said, you'd never believe it. (laughs) Also, one more thing. Um, You've mentioned since the death of Christ that the Gentiles received the the spiritual blessings of Uh the new covenant and all the covenants. But are there any specific spiritual blessings that Gentiles received through the land in the Davidic covenant? The spiritual blessings of the... Of the, the land covenant and the Davidic covenant. Well, spiritual blessing the Davidic covenant is the fact that the Messiah had come. He's the one that provided the necessary salvation. Mm-hmm. He fulfills the seed facet of the Abrahamic covenant, and through him salvation comes, and therefore faith in the Messiah gives us salvation. Thus our Gentiles benefit in the spiritual blessings of the, land, of the um, Davidic covenant. Mm-hmm. Of the, Davidic, of the land covenant, I would say there's no spe- specific spiritual promises there specifically. But the Abrahamic and New Covenants are clearly, and Davidic, they're clearly spiritual promises in which the Gentiles become partakers, is the word that Paul uses. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead. Yeah, I just need a clarification. There are some who believe that since the uh, real King David will be resurrected, that he will rule as Christ's regent. Did I hear you say earlier that there might be two, like Christ will rule over the Gentile nations and King David would actually rule over Jerusalem? Did I get you right or no? I said in the the, uh, government of the kingdom, there will be one world king of kings, Lord of lords, that will be the Messiah himself. But underneath him will be two branches of government. There will be a Gentile branch of government, a Jewish branch of government. And quarreling with the Messiah, with the Gentile branch of government, will be the church saints and tribulation saints. But quarreling over Israel will be the resurrected King David. And the David will be the uh, 12 sons, the, the 12 apostles, because he promised us to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, for example. So there will be two separate branches of government. But it will be a very functional government. There won't be any red tape. Being Jewish, there might be some, there'll be blue and white tape, but no red tape. <laughs> And so both would rule with a rod of iron. He would rule the rod of iron, yes. Thank you. It would be an absolute monarchy. No voting. Huh? Huh? No voting. 
Good morning, sir. I want to thank you for the books that you've written. I've got a bunch at home I've been reading. Um, I have a question about uh, Deuteronomy 11.24, where uh, it says, Every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, that land will be given to you. And when that was said, they were in the wilderness, uh, the tribes of Israel. Now, uh, according to the Bible, it says that all the land that Abram resided in would be given to his descendants. And based on what you've said here from Egypt all the way to the river Euphrates, would that also include the land of Midian and Arabia since uh, Galatians 4.25 states that that is where Mount Sinai is? And as a result, all of that well, should be given to Israel in the future? Got, well, Mount Sinai, you got convinced by a, a DVD you saw. Okay. But the um, Arabia, in what Paul was writing, was the Roman province of Arabia. The Roman province of Arabia, look at some Bible maps, that included South Sinai and the Western Negev. So um, Mount Sinai was not in Saudi Arabia. Mount Sinai has to be there in South Sinai, was now in the uh, Western Negev area. It has to be in that region, but it can't be in, the, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it, the, the word Arabia there is used as a province of Rome, not as a, the territory called Saudi Arabia today. Okay. And so on. So, <clears throat> anyone else? Well, you're dismissed till one thirty for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>